Let's have a look at a longer example. And why a longer example? Why well, I guess the other was too simple, right? Maybe it was good for the beginning, but we just have these tiny rules with one or two atoms in it. So now let's try with something a bit longer, but still it's um, manageable. No, and okay, I wanted to see here, especially two things. The first one is now in this example, we may have more than one literal in the body, still only two, but with this, you get the idea that you can have as many literals in the body as you want. Here we have not B, not C, and here C and not A. And this basically is uh, a straightforward coming from when we were. So it doesn't matter the order in which we write the literals here in the body. And when we are going to apply the rule, instead of checking or of checking just one literal, we may check two or three or whatever. We just have to check all the literals that occur in the body of the rule to see whether the rule applies, right? Good, and the other thing is that now that we have a longer program, it will be the case that we can write it in order in different ways. Sorry, there's not a unique way to order the rules of this program. And the nice thing is that no matter which of these correct orders we choose, the result will be the same. So still we are in the same situation that the answer sets of a logic program are the result of applying the rules in order. And as I told you before, we have to qualify this this definition a bit when we get to these recursive programs in a few sections. But for now, this is it. And uh, yes, and then this, what this also means is that in our easy ASP methodology, what we do is we write the program in one of the possible orders in which the program can be written. Good. Okay, so let's see this, this example. So here, initially, we build the answer set incrementally. So we start with the empty set. There's nothing there. And then what could we apply from here? So these two rules have the A, so they, we must wait to apply them before we apply the A. And these two have B, C, and A, so they must wait for all these to be applied. So initially, we can only apply the choice rule. And then this gives us to these two set that again, we know that these two are the answer sets of this program. And now comes the interesting situation where we have we can apply this rule B if A, because the, the rules that have A in the head have already been applied. And another way to see there is no rule left to apply that has A in the head. But we have a similar situation with this choice rule, right? Because it, also the A is what occurs in the body. So the rules for A have already been applied or from the other perspective, there are no rules with A in the head left to be applied once we apply this, right? And, um, well, not once we apply this one. So even before we apply this rule, since we have applied this choice rule, there are no rules left to apply. Good, let's move on then. We could choose apply this one or this other. So in this case, let's apply B if A. And then we add B to this set, and here nothing happens because A is not in the set. And again, now, what can we apply at this point? So we can apply the choice rule because if we could apply it before, then it makes sense that we can also apply it now. And these two depend on C, so we are forced to apply this because these two, we cannot apply them yet. So then we apply the choice rule. And then what it tells us is that if A is not in the set, then we may add C to our answer set. So here we have A, then nothing happens, but here A is not in the set, then we can choose to add the A to our set. And then we have this new option that was not here before. And we know then that these three sets are the answer sets of this program. And okay, let me see, what can we apply? Look here, we could already apply this constraint if we wanted, because it depends on C and on A and all the rules for C and A have been applied, but the same situation is for this rule because it depends on B and on C and they have been applied already here, you see? Then in this case, we apply the D and it tells us that if B is not in a set and C is not in the set, then we can add the D. And actually here this has the C and here this has the B, so the rule doesn't change anything on this set, but here we neither have the B or the C, so we add the D and we reach this set. And again, we know these are the, the answer sets of the program that contains just these four rules. And now there's only one rule left to apply. We apply it and it tells us delete the sets that contain C and do not contain the A. And this is the only one, so we delete it. Here, 
this does not contain the C, so the constraint does not apply. And here it contains the A, so the constraint is not violated. That's also another way to say it. Hence, it survives. And we are left with these two, which are the stable models of these five rules, or the, sorry, the answer sets. This is the name that I'm using in the tutorial, answer sets. But it's also, it's a synonymous of the word uh, stable models in this setting, right? So then we know, again, these are the answer sets of this program, which is exactly the same. Sorry, these are the answer sets of this program because we have applied the rules of the program in order and the result of applying the rules in order are the answer sets of the program, right? Then this is it. Now, okay, and of course we can put it into a file, example2.lp, and we may write according to our methodology of easy answer set programming, we can write it in this order and this is one of the ways to Right? So in this way, the, the, we can easily understand the program because the answer sets are just the result of applying the rules in the order that we have written them. And on the other hand, it's a natural way to write the program because this goes in order as you would describe the things normally or as you would do in a recipe where you are telling, look, how do you build this set? Well, I, I do it like this. First I do this, then I do that, then the other thing. And I am not telling you um, how to add the C before I have told you how to add the A because I'm a polite person and then I go in the right order, right? Because I want to make your life easy so I write the things in the nice way. Good, then we said there was another order. So first we have the choice rule, but at this point we can also apply the, this choice rule on C if not A, right? We said before, it also only depends on the A, the only rule we say in the head, we have applied it already, so we can apply it right now. We don't have to apply the B this rule for B necessarily at this point, right? So if we apply it, then we have the, these two choices on C for the set where A was not there, right? Here A is there, then nothing happened. Then we know these three are the answer sets of the program that contains these two rules. And now at this point, we could already apply B if A, but we can actually also apply the constraint on C and not A because the rules for C and A, we have already applied them. So let's do it. Then we eliminate the sets that have C and do not have A, which in this case is just this one. Then we are left this, with these two sets that we know that are the answer sets of the program that contains these true rules. And now what next? So we are only left with the second and the fifth one and the fifth one, sorry, with the second and the fourth one, right? It's this that I have here a bit covered with the B and the D. No? So the one with D, I cannot apply it because it depends on B and the rule on B has not been applied yet. Then I know I have to apply this. Then I get the B here and still nothing happens on the other side. And then when I apply the one that is left, it tells me that I must add the D if B is not in the set and C is not in the set. So here B and C are not in the set, then I get the D. And here nothing happens because B is in the set. So the rule, when we apply it, doesn't give us anything, doesn't oblige us, oblige us to, to, to add this D. Then we know that after applying these five rules, we, uh, we come to these two sets and then these two sets are the answer sets of this program. And if you remember from our, our, our previous run with the other order, we reach exactly the same, num the same answer set, which is what we expect, right? So if we run the rules of a program in order, then the sets that we obtain are the answer sets of the program. And it doesn't matter which of this order we choose as long as they are correct orders, as long as we only apply the rules when all the rules, so let's do it, let's backtrack a bit. If we apply all the rules in order and we apply a rule if order, in order, if for all the atoms in the body, the rules that have those atoms in the head have been applied before. Or similarly, for all the atoms in the body, there are no rule left with those atoms in the body to apply. There are no rules with those atoms, sorry. There are no rules with those atoms in the head that I still have to apply, right? Good, then let's move on. So again, we could write the program in this order if we wanted, 
why not? We had the other order, but we could also write it in this order to agree with the easy ASP methodology. For Klingo, it doesn't matter the order in which we write it. But according to our methodology, we can write it in this order because then the answer set are just the result of applying the rules in order, and it's a natural way to write it and of reading it. Good. Now let's run this program again in Klingo as we did before. Okay, then we are back to our Jupyter notebook. Here we have our longer example that I am putting into in this file example2.lp and I've written the file here as in the first order that we have written it. And then we can execute this cell and then we can go and check here that actually we have written the file, this is example2.lp. And then if we come here, we can run Klingo with this file example2.lp and ask for all answer sets. And as you saw already there, the solutions are D and AB, which is exactly what we were finding here. Good, then uh, I wanted to show you that the order of the bodies that does not matter. So we can also see it here running the system. So here, let's move this not B to the end of the rule. And let's move also this C to the end of the rule. And we will see that we get here the same answer sets again D and AB because for Klingo it doesn't matter in which order we write the literals in the body of a rule. We simply, according to the way we are, we are studying the logic programs, we just care about applying the rules and for applying the rules it doesn't matter in which order the literals in the body are written because we want to check whether all of them um, hold in a way. No? Then if we are going to check all of them, it doesn't matter in which order we check. Nice. Then, um, okay, we have seen that there was another way to, to write the rules, another, sorry, another order in which the rules would still be in order. So here we could have the have written the choice rule before and then the constraint and again this is just for our methodological purpose purposes because we want to have the rules written in order so this would be another way of writing them in order and as expected if we save the file and we run it we get exactly the same answer sets because for Klingo it doesn't matter. For us, this is a nice way of writing it because it's easy to read. But for Klingo it doesn't matter if we move this to here to the top. We save it, again, same result. Okay, I think I won't do this anymore. I think the message is clear. For Klingo the order does not matter, but for us, methodologically, it's nice to write the things in order. Good, then something also to take into account about this ordering is that when we write the program, we tell, so Klingo will enumerate the answer sets, but it is undefined in which order it will enumerate them. So here it printed first the answer set with D and then the one with AB, but it could have been the other way around that it printed first the one with AB and then the one with D. This is, this is not defined in the input. We cannot tell the system which to print first. And also related to this, here it printed A and B, but it could have also printed first B and then A. An answer set is a set of atoms, then the elements are not ordered. So it's not defined in which order it's going to print the atoms in an answer set. It will print it simply in some order. Nice. Then what else we have here? We are asking for all answer sets. But we could also ask simply for one. And if we ask for one, it has printed the one with D. But it could have also printed the one with A and B. It's just a matter of, of the way Klingo solves the program that first it finds this with D and then it's the one that prints. And if we ask it for two, well, it gives us the two that it finds. But okay, let me show you something here that I have missed, which is interesting. Here, I tell it, give me one, it prints one, and it says the models, I printed one, and this plus here means 
there may be more. I have not looked for more, so it may be the case that there are more. I don't know it. Now, if I ask for two, in this case, it will tell me, look, I found two and I know that they are all that are there. There, there are no more than two. And, I, and the way of telling us that there is there are no more is by not writing this plus here. It could also be the case that we asked it for two, but it, is two, but it told us there may be more. But in this case, it knows that there are no more and it, that's the reason why it doesn't write the plus here. Let's see then another example below on this. And of course, if we ask Klingo for three, what can it do? It can just print the two that are there, right? This is to be expected. Good, now let's have a look uh, again at this thing of the ordering in which Klingo prints the answer sets. And let's see this program. We are now we are I'm using this cell magic cell command with Klingo and I tell him good give me all the answer sets of this program. So I have the choice on A and the choice on B. So then you can see the choice on A gives me the empty set and A. And then when I do the choice on B, I get here the empty set, here B, here uh, maybe A and here A B. So these are the four answers that I obtained, right? You can think a bit about it. It's, I think it's very easy. And now what happens if I write them in the other order here below, then it turns out that Klingo prints them the same answer sets, but in a different order. You see first the, in both cases, it printed first the empty one, but here it prints first the A and then the B. And again, as it's written here, there is no way to tell Klingo in which order to print the answer sets. And then it may be the case that when you reorder the rules, they are printed in another order. But this doesn't mean that the answer sets is different. It's just that Klingo can enumerate them in any order, right? And something that you have to care about is what is written in this, in this warning here. And it's that you should not get confused if you ask for two answer sets here, then it prints the first two, right? And look here, it's telling us there may be more. So it prints the empty and A. And if we ask here for the first two, then it will print first the empty and B. And it says again, there may be more. But please don't think that given that it has printed here the empty and A and here the empty and B, then the answer sets are different. The answer sets are the same. It's just that Klingo is enumerating them in a different order. So if you ask two, you will see two that may be different from these other two because it's just enumerating them in a different order. Okay, good. So I think this is what I wanted to show you about this longer example. I hope you enjoyed it and you understood it. And yeah, that's it. So see you in the next video. Stay tuned. Ciao.